Hey guys, I'm Dimitri. I'm the new children's director at Buffalo Eat Free, and I am thrilled to be here serving you guys, your families, and the community. I'm super excited about the future we're going to do together and the partnership that we have. I have a couple of announcements for you, four to be exact. The first is service times! Service times, we're going to have two, okay? This Sunday is regular. Next Sunday, the second Sunday of September, we have two services. 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m., okay? You can come to either one. Entirely your choice. We'll be super excited to see you at either or both. Hey, why not build relationships? The second announcement is giving. We want to thank you. On behalf of Buffalo E Free, we really want to thank you for how faithful you guys are in giving. It makes all the difference. All the work we get to do day in and day out in the office and in the community is because you guys give. We really are thankful for it. And if you want to set up online giving, now that church is a little bit different for a while, we will have that option just right on the screen. Feel free to click it and get set up. It makes it easier. I do online giving personally. It's just easier. That's my opinion. The second, third reminder <laughs> is Awana. So as you guys know, Awana is our Wednesday night kids program. We are thrilled to be bringing it back. It's going to be a hybrid, okay? It's not going to be as it usually is because we want to adapt to the times of COVID and to the culture that we are in. And we know things are hard for parents right now. We want to make it easier, not harder. We don't want to be a problem. We want to be a blessing to you guys. Now, Awana registration is September 16th on that Wednesday in the evening. More will go out about that, so don't worry too much. But we're thrilled to be bringing Awana back. And the very last thing is church survey. So I hope all of you got the church survey. It is helping us develop curriculum, develop security measures, develop safety measures. It's helping us make Buffalo E Free a safer place to come to, to worship the Lord together, to partner together in ministry. The survey is helpful. I know some of you might receive it a couple times. That's okay. If you haven't done it, please do it. It makes a huge difference in how we know to go forward how we know about your comfort level, and how we can better serve you as your pastors. So please do the survey. If you've already done the survey, you're a rock star, and we're really thankful for you, and you're the reason our job is a little bit easier instead of harder. Thank you. And the next thing I want to introduce is our very own MVP, Pastor Greg. Thank you, guys. Hi, church family. It's Pastor Greg. I just want to talk with you heart to heart about the upcoming fall schedule and just allow you to have a chance to process it. Number one, if you have any questions, please call us here at the church or please contact your elder. And you can find that online or you can find that by giving the church a phone call. So here's what's going to happen starting next Sunday. We will, number one, still have the online service. Online service will not stop because we know that some of you are more comfortable being online during this time of, of COVID. So we are going to continue that. That will stay in place. Number two, we are changing the service times. We will have a 9 a.m. service and a 10.45 service, and they will be slightly different. So please listen closely to understand which service you need to attend. 9 a.m. service. This is a mask mandatory service. We have a number of our people who are extremely vulnerable or work in industries with vulnerable patients. And because of their jobs and because of what they do, they need to be in a service where they know that everyone is wearing a mask. And we heard them. We heard them tell us that. So we're asking that even if you have the right to take your mask off, not in this service. We ask that everyone keeps their mask on. We will have some masks available if you need them. And so please, if you come to this service, this is your service. If you need to wear a mask, this is the service we ask you to come. Now, here's how the service will go. It will have a welcome. We'll have a prelude, a welcome, announcements, things like that, prayer, communion. 
and then the sermon. We will then dismiss those who are uncomfortable being in a time of singing, because even with masks on, some people are uncomfortable with singing. We will do the singing portion at the end of the service. So you'll have a chance to leave if you're uncomfortable with that. So please, uh, if you need to wear a mask, please be at this service. Likewise, if you do not or are not able to have the ability to wear a mask the whole time, we ask that you do not attend the first service. Now, we understand that some people may have a little bit of trouble breathing. We have a limited amount of clear plexi masks that will be available for those people. But again, you will need to wear that the whole time in the service. So 9 a.m., mask mandatory service. Then we'll have a time of break. Then we will at 1045 start the second service. Now that is a mask. Again, we, we ask that you wear your masks, but we will also, if you have a reason that you need to remove your mask, that's the service we need you to go to. So if you got breathing issues or you got other reasons why you cannot wear a mask, that's the service. So if you're in that service, and you see someone at 1045 not have their mask on, they probably have a reason for that. And we ask you to accept that and, and understand that because that's the service we've asked them to attend. So hopefully I've made that really clear. Now we're also going to ask that as everyone comes in, if you can come in through door one and then leave through door two so that if people are coming in, they're leaving through a different door. Now, if obviously uh, you park in the parking lot and walking or anything like that is an issue and you need to enter and leave through door one, we're not going to uh, be upset at that or anything like that. Uh, we understand that uh, life is life and we need to to adapt for those who need adapt adaptation. So that's going to happen. Now we are going to try to, uh, between the service, have a little bit of a fellowship time as weather allows that half hour for people as they leave door two. Um, I'm not sure we'll do it the very first week, but after that we're going to try to have time for people to have maybe a bottle of water and talk uh, as we look down the road, we're going to look into how can we maybe serve coffee and stuff like that in the future, but not the first week. We just want to see how things go. By the way, I want to say thank you to you as a congregation. You have been most gracious to those of us in leadership. You have been so kind. One of the things we've asked is that you get back to us about the survey that you get back to us about your thoughts and your comments and and you have and we would continue to ask that you get back to us about surveys and about comments you have about things but one of the things most of you folks say to us is we understand you're trying your best we understand that this is unprecedented that we understand that um, this stuff has never been experienced before and we're praying for you in leadership and, and we support uh, your trying to do what's best for the congregation. And I just want to say thank you for having such a gracious spirit. Um, I, I want to let you know that there are other congregations out there that are not experiencing the kindness that you as a congregation are giving us. So what about children? We are not going to have Sunday morning children's ministry on site for the month of September. We are going to start sometime in October. Why? Number one, we want to see how the morning services go. We want to get those down. Number two, parents are going through a time of extreme change, trying to figure out the school systems and all those type of things. So we wanted to give them one less thing to worry about during the month of September. Three, we want to watch what the schools do. 
We want to take some cues from them. So for example, if after two weeks the schools go into total lockdown, we want to be able to adapt and adopt to that. So some of the things that will be online will be things like a Sunday school type lesson online that uh, Dimitri is developing. We're also in process with the idea of maybe developing some through the week devotional series for families with children. So watch your online presence. Watch our YouTube channel because that's where we will more, li more than likely post them. So we will not neglect our children, but we will uh, take everything we can do, every precaution we can do to make it as safe as possible and as um, less stressful for our families as, as, as we are able to do. So the second service, we will have worship music at the beginning of the service. It'll be more like a traditional service that will go from 1045 to approximately noon. It will close with my sermon. So it'll be, a, again, a little bit different uh, than what we're, you're, you may be used to, uh, but that's how we will be operating. Uh, you will hear an announcement this morning also about Awana and uh, how that's going to, to act. Also, we sent out an email about Awana, so please check your emails, check your spam if you didn't get it, uh, because that's going to be very important for midweek. Adult Christian Ed and Sunday Morning Youth we are waiting till October to decide on how to integrate those as well. So for the month of September, no children's ministry on site, no adult CE on site, no youth in the morning on site. Now youth will meet in the evening, but they will not meet in the morning. Whew, a lot of stuff, my friends. And I want to thank you again for being such a gracious and kind congregation as we walk through these crazy times together. May God bless. Well, hey, church family, today is Communion Sunday. Uh, so if you don't have your elements ready to participate in communion, I want you to hit that pause button right now and run and grab that and come back and we'll take communion together. Uh, just a few things before we dive in. Communion is a uniting thing for those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so if you have not trusted in Jesus for salvation, um, then please refrain from joining us with communion and participating in communion this morning. Uh, and we look forward to maybe that possibility of taking communion together in the future. Uh, we pray that God would just open your eyes to the reality of uh, your brokenness and sinfulness and how God's grace meets you there in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And for those of you who are parents, you are the ones who are the spiritual leaders of your home. And so you know if, you're, if your uh, child is ready to participate in communion with us together. Uh, Pastor Greg's going to be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning, so I thought it'd be really fitting to read uh, Philippians chapter 2 together, and then we'll participate in communion together. This is the NLT translation, so a little bit different, uh, but I thought it'd be cool to read it together. So here we go. Is there any encouragement for belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only to your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor 
and gave them, him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What a beautiful Savior we have. He came and humbled himself that we would be made right with God. And that is what communion celebrates this morning. And so I want you to think about that and reflect on that as we participate in communion. And Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake with the bread together. In the same way he took the cup, so let's take the cup, which is a symbol of the new covenant that we have in Christ and the forgiveness of sin by the spilling of our blood's Savior. Let's participate together. Now would you pray with me? And then we're going to worship God through singing this morning. So would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the gift of communion. That we get to come to your table as brothers and sisters in Christ. That it is the gospel that unites us. In a world that's so divided right now, may we cling to Christ. May we have the mind of Christ. May we see all the encouragement that comes from being united with Jesus Christ. So God, we worship you this morning. Now, through everything that happens this morning, may you be glorified in everything we say and do. As we hear the word of God taught through Pastor Greg, uh, may you be exalted during that time. And as we sing songs and praises to you, uh, may our hearts overflow with the love that we've received through salvation in Jesus Christ. And God, may our worship be a pleasing aroma and offering and fragrance to you this morning. Thanks for your love, for saving us, for communion, and for the body of Christ together. In your name we pray. Amen. Now would you join us as we worship and sing together.
crazy times we live in. I don't know about you, but I am COVID tired. I am tired of having to sit apart from people. I am tired of having to wear a mask. I'm tired. I have fatigue. You probably do too. I'm also heartbroken over the social unrest in our nation. I know that this upcoming election is going to be probably the most divisive and the most um, nation-rending in recent history. We are watching as various groups in our country cry out and say, follow me, listen to me, and then some other group runs up, no, 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 listen to me, they're wrong, they're evil, we're this, we're this, and what about my rights, and what about your rights? And you don't get rights. And, 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 and it's enough to make your head spin. I have a question for you this morning. How do we, as the body of Jesus Christ, respond? How do we, as the church, respond? What's the proper way of response. Do we, do we pick winners and losers? Or is there another way? My heart was drawn to Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 27 and through Philippians chapter 2. And I want to warn you. I want to warn you. God speaking through Paul, he's blunt, he's direct, but on the other hand, he's like a beautiful artist. He wants to paint a picture. And he's even going to take a moment and incorporate music into his answer of what the church is to be 
in times like this. God will be clear. And when he's finished, he's not going to leave anything to imagination. You will know what he requires of you and I. Now, today's sermon is not for the faint of heart. It's going to call you to a way of life that is not going to be easy. It's going to go against your human nature. But let's dive in. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Wow. Did you hear that? Live a way of life that is worthy. Hey, citizen of heaven. Hey, church. Hey, person who says, I follow Jesus. Live a life-changing, heaven-bankrupting gospel of Jesus Christ worthy life. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ did bankrupt heaven. It cost heaven everything. So live in a manner worthy of that, church. Don't play games, church. Don't take it lightly, church. If you have your pen and you have the old-fashioned paper and pencil, I want you to underline it. If you have a highlighter thing on your electronics, I want you to highlight that. Live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now keep your pen ready or your highlighter ready because he's going to tell us how. Let's dive back in. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm, underline that, in one spirit, underline that, with one mind, underline that, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Got to underline that. You can switch colors if you want each one to stand out, but underline them and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Circle, not frightened. How do I live that life? I stand firm in one spirit. I strive. And that word strive means to fight, to work side by side, to, to be arm in arm, to watch one another's back for the faith of the gospel. Do you see the theme here? Be united, not divided. What does Strive say? It says it's hard work. It's a struggle. It's not a life of ease. Friends, division is easy. Unity is hard. I've been a pastor for 35 years full time. I have seen way too many churches that allow division in their midst. I have seen many people who said, yes, I'm a Jesus person, be cruel to the people that they call brothers and sisters. And Paul says it so simply, so elegantly, so beautifully. Be worthy and do it by knocking off that division stuff. Now we are to divide over doctrinal truth. But those are pretty clear lines. And I'll be honest, in 35 years, I rarely have seen people divide over doctrinal truth. They divide over everything else. He goes on and says, be united and be fearless. Don't be frightened. Don't be scared. We talked about that. Why? Why don't I have to be afraid? Because of who I know and what I know. 
I don't need to be afraid. Why is this important? Why should I even care, Pastor Greg? Well, let's dive in. See what God has to say. Don't listen to me. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict you saw I had and now hear that I still have. I need to be united with you. I need to be fearless because I've been chosen just like you to be blessed with suffering. Now, I know some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, God. If suffering's a present from you, do you mind if I don't open it? But you know what, friends? It's only when we walk through the fire do we really get to see what God can do. It's not fun. It hurts. And we've talked about that. But it's part of his refining process. It's part of his process to grow us up. Now we get to chapter 2. In the ESV, it starts out with the word, so. Now I want you to circle so, and I want you to draw it all the way back to verse 27. Because all that stuff we've had in the middle, that's the explanation, that's like a giant parenthesis. It's like saying it this way, only let your manner of life be worthy of, God, of the gospel of Christ, so if there's any encouragement in Christ. You know, they, they connect together. It's, it's the word if or since, and it's not that it's, if it's like it's not true, because it sounds like a question, if there's any encouragement in Christ, could it be true? Yeah, 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 there is. This is the encouragement, though. This word has the idea of like the Good Samaritan. Remember that story? The guy comes along, finds the man alongside the road, beaten and battered, and he, and he binds up his wounds, and he takes him to a place of safety, and, and he even takes care of his needs past that time. This is the kind of assistance that comes alongside to offer comfort, counsel, exhortation, help. Jesus will use a word later called helper, and he uses that to describe the Holy Spirit, the helper he gives us. His encouragement to you and I as believers, because as the Holy Spirit indwells us, he calls us to something powerful to do what, what is that you want to know? What is that powerful thing the Holy Spirit wants us to do? I'm not going to tell you yet. You're going to have to wait. Notice the other things. Any comfort from love. This is the idea of someone coming and speaking words of love and encouragement. It's, it's, it speaks of a close relationship. It's Jesus bestowing this on the believer through the gift of salvation, through his constant prayers for us and with us. And then we, as this recipient of the love of Jesus, pour it out on other believers. And this in turn demonstrates through us God's love for them. This love calls us to something so amazing. And you want to know what it is? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Notice it goes on and says, any participation in the Spirit. That word participation means partnership. Mutual sharing with the Holy Spirit. It's because you and I, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, as the church in which the Holy Spirit resides, as the home of the Holy Spirit, we, we have a partnership. That's why it's important that we don't inhibit or hinder His work. That's important why we don't live a life that grieves him. The Holy Spirit has such a powerful role in what we are called to do. And you know what we're called to do? I'm going to tell you in a moment. 
Notice it goes on to say, any affection or sympathy. This speaks of grace bestowed by the Spirit. It carries an expression of what it means to be dearly loved because we have received through the Spirit the sympathy and affections of Jesus Christ himself, the compassions of Christ. We have been recalled to something great. And you know what that great thing is? I'll tell you in a minute. Have I driven you crazy yet? Jesus encourages and comforts us with his love and gives us the fellowship through the Holy Spirit and affection and sympathy and a heart of compassion. How can we not respond? How can we not respond after all these gifts? He says, this is the powerful thing I want you to do. I've been promising to tell you. This is the powerful thing. You ready? Complete my joy. Did you catch that? Complete my joy. By being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Because of the goodness of God and because of God doing all this for us, Paul begs them to make his joy complete by doing three key things. Have the same mind. That means be like-minded. It's an even better way of saying this is thinking about the same attitude set. We don't have to agree on favorite teams, politics, favorite foods, but we must have a similar direction, a similar attitude. It means an attitude of seeking unity and agreement. It's striving for harmony. It's agreeing to walk in the spirit. It's agreeing not to walk in the flesh on matters of life by setting your mind on the things not of earth, but the things from above, to quote Colossians chapter 3. It comes from having a right perspective about our own opinions. It's pursuing sound judgment and seeking the mind of Christ. Now, this isn't a false peace. It's not a peace that, that says, I, I, we can't talk about the issues. But it says we're going to talk about the issues with the right mindset, the right attitude, an attitude that seeks to bring glory to God and give deference to my brothers and sisters. Notice it says, have the same love. That is to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to each other, serving each other, caring for each other. It is loving in deed and in truth. It's love for the body of Christ, which is the mark of the church. Remember, we've been told that by this, the world will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. You and I both have heard way too many horror stories of how churches have mistreated people. You and I know way too many people who've walked away from the church and said, I never want to be part of that again because of lack of love. We need to have a love that shines through during trying times. It must sound like a church bell in a steeple in a community that the church says we are not going to be divided by lack of love. May God raise up in our nation churches that truly love on one another. Notice it goes on to say being in full accord and of one of mind. What that means is literally meaning one souled. Be inseparable in your heart. Live in selfless harmony with other believers. Objectively, we ground everything in the Word of God. Subjectively, we allow brothers and sisters to have on the minors the freedom to disagree respectfully with each other. And when we are of one mind, 
It means we are intent on one purpose. And that one purpose is to make the previous three things that I described happen. It is to love the Lord and to love the body of Christ. So how do we do this, Pastor Greg? Well, the scriptures go on. It says, know the enemy of unity. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. First, the negative. This examines our motives. It calls out our pride, our narcissism. Who are you doing this for? You or for someone else? And can I let you know something? This question is always at the forefront of my mind. Who is this action for? Is it to make me look good? Is it for the kingdom? You know why it's in the front of my mind? It's because I struggle with that. It's a hard question because often we can tell ourselves, this is for others, this is for the kingdom, but it's really for me. It's really to make me look good. It's really to give me what I want. And we have to be brutally honest with ourselves on whether it's for the kingdom or for us. Then it goes on. It gives us the positive. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This addresses our priorities. It's positive where the first three were negative. Do we have a mindset of lifting others up? Do we seek their best welfare? And this is where that same love comes in. And it's costly. And it hurts. It hurts sometimes to put others ahead of you. And every parent watching this morning knows exactly what I'm talking about. I like what someone once said. They said, Pastor, you know what it means to be a parent? And I said, what's that? He goes, it means you sign your life away. You will love someone and sacrifice for someone who will never truly understand. Someone else said it this way, becoming a parent, a good parent means that you are getting ready to die to self. So it is with the body of Christ, looking toward others' interests. Too often, we're focused on our own. But then it there's, you say, Pastor Greg, when you read that passage, you, you missed a phrase. But in humility. Here's the bridge. We can't do it in pride. We can't do it in ambition. We have to be humble. And this word humble here does not mean saying, you're superior to me in my skill. You're superior to me in my morality. You're better than me. That's not what this passage is teaching. It is saying, I will humble myself and I will serve you. I like what John Piper says. This comes from the gospel of brokenness. The gospel of brokenness is key. The gospel frees us from a mindset of merit or entitlement. Friends, there's no room for entitlement in the gospel. Brokenness is there because the gospel of brokenness takes us to a Savior who lives, who, who, who lived in humility. And his humility fills us with the hope that is found in him. So how do we live a humble life? How do we get this humility? Well, Paul points us to the gospel. He always takes us back to the gospel. And with the gospel, he retells the church. He says, hey, church, don't forget the gospel. What it takes to set you free is what it takes to live in humility. Listen at verse 5. Have this mind among you. Circle mind, because it ties back to all the other minds we've seen. And this is how to have that mind, which is yours 
Okay, you own it in Christ Jesus. Friends, you just need to ask. Christ says it's yours if you're in him. He's going to give it to those who earnestly seek. Now he says, now look at the example. Verse 6, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. <laughs> did you see that? Underline that. But emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. It, it, it begins with his humble sacrifice. He gave up everything for us. He came into our world and took our form. He came as a baby to a lowly teenager and presented himself to the most despised people on planet Earth at that time, shepherds. And he didn't insist on what he was re entitled to receive. When he was born, he was entitled to receive our worship. He was entitled to receive the best that this world had to offer. He was entitled to everything, and he did not insist on it. Verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Humble obedience. Death on a cross. The form of death that was perfected by the Romans, and it was perfected for one purpose, to destroy all human dignity. It was a, a form of death that was reserved for slaves and criminals. It was so grotesque that this sensibilities of humanity would turn in horror from it and so the romans and others would use it as a way to warn people if you mess with us this will happen to you and so they would put them up around you are conquered don't rebel against us It was an in-your-face sign of, look what we can do to you, so don't mess with us. And those who died that death were considered human garbage. That's why Christianity has been so confusing to so many throughout the ages. For the Greeks, the cross is a scandal. In fact, the word is scandalous. Why would you allow your God to come and suffer and be degraded like that? The Jews thought he was cursed. The Romans had no word. But remember the Pompeii, you know, the place that got covered by the volcano? In their excavations, they found a, a picture, a picture on a wall. It had a cross. It had a Christian praying to the cross. And on the cross wasn't a person, it was a donkey. In their minds, Jesus was a bad joke if he allowed himself to die on the cross. What irony. Think about this with me. The one who holds the universe together by his words, who created the arms that beat him, the tree he dies on, the iron that the nails are made from, should allow his created beings, who he could literally just speak and their atoms would be splashed across the universe, allows them to do what they did to him. That is called humility, my friends. And he is our example. If anyone had the right and entitlement, it was Jesus. And he chose humility instead. You know what, though? I'm glad Paul doesn't stay here. 
it'd be really sad. Because Jesus went through the cross, watch. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. Christ's humility teaches us how to walk in humility. And as we walk in humility, we can be of one mind. The same love for each other. Because of what Christ has done for us, we can walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Fearless and united with our brothers and sisters. And we can bow our knee and proclaim Jesus as Lord. But why? But why? One of my favorite kids' books is the Chronicles of Narnia. And in the very first book, we meet Edmund. And if you're honest, we're all like Edmund. Edmund isn't the oldest brother, so nobody looks to him for strength or leadership. He's not as clever as his oldest sister, and he's not as cute as his younger sister. Edmund is a little overshadowed, and he's not as lovable, and Edmund feels a little lost. So he arrives to Narnia, and he gets separated from his siblings, and guess who finds him? The White Witch! And she offers some treats, and she speaks to his, his ego. And he gives himself to her side. And he betrays his family. Now the story goes on, and I won't take you through the story, but eventually he rejoins his family. He kind of realizes his, his mistake and rejoins them. But at a crucial moment in the storyline, she, the witch, confronts the king, Aslan the lion, and says, I own him. I want Edmund. He belongs to me. I get to kill him. And Aslan the lion, the ruler, the righteous king, offers himself in Edmund's place. Now this sends fear throughout Aslan's forces because the White Witch has her forces of darkness and they outnumber Aslan's forces. And without Aslan, the, the, the side of good knows it can't win. But Aslan takes Edmund's place. And he's taken to this giant table, he's mistreated, he's shaved, and then he is killed. And the two little girls watch as this happens. And they start weeping. They weep for their friend. But then... The lion comes back to life. He stirs. You see, there was a decree that an innocent would offer himself in the place of the one that was guilty. That innocent would come back to life. And then the lion roars. And he sets his kingdom free. He sets his people free. But what if Edmund, what if the traitor, the betrayer, the one who had willingly fallen under the spell of evil, Aslan sets him free too. 
His soul was free from the control of the witch. The betrayer, the one who had reveled in evil, now becomes a righteous king in Narnia. But as king, he humbled himself and served the great king, Aslan. And he dedicated his life to follow the great lion's example. Our king came. He took our place, not on a table, but on a cross. And we who betrayed him, we who deserved the cross, have been set free by putting our faith in him. And he has made us heirs of heaven. So now, be fearless. In unity, let us humbly follow his, his, our king and his, his example. Let us humbly serve one another in the name of Jesus Christ and point other Edmonds to our King. Amen.
What a great message from Pastor Greg on Philippians chapter 2. And now I'd like to just pray a prayer of blessing over you. May the Lord grant you the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments can dismay, and the passion that burns like fire. Go and live a life humbly serving God, humbly serving others, and worshiping Jesus, and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those around us this week. Go and be blessed.